And so how do we mediate uh, between the tuition of a mainstream language such as English in a country where there are different uh, languages spoken and where the main uh, official language is a, a minor language? Uh, and because of this, uh, because of this main question, and also how can ESOL tutors implement the tuition of a minor language such as uh, such as Welsh, when the main aim of the course is to teach a dominant language like English, then makes us rethink and reassess the order of, let's say, importance, which is quite a, a strong word, uh, among languages and identities because each language carries a specific not specific a broad range of identities uh, that goes within the national uh, the national borders but also beyond them and so for this reason I chose uh, three sort of three main sources one of them is an article from the BBC uh, website which is about the erosion of the Welsh language and the linguistic and cultural impact of such phenomena and then a repository which I found quite interesting that has been developed by the University of Oxford is called the Migration Observatory uh, and it, it, it focuses on the English language use and proficiency in the UK uh, studying uh, a wide range of data collected among uh, people living in the UK, uh, mostly as asylum seekers and refugees. Uh, I've also included an article which which is a bit date outdated. Well, let's say uh, from two thousand and six, which is uh, a quite interesting, uh, which gives an interesting. Uh, uh, insights in the uh, field of ESO and EAL specifically, so English as an additional language, uh, to set out the trends that were uh, that were uh, ongoing at the moment, um, to see where where the UK government stands and where it comes from in terms of language tuition or mainstream language tuition as opposed to English as an additional language, because there are different ways of approaching the study, uh, the tuition of, uh, of English as a language. Uh, and so I collected a few notes, uh, a few main points from these three uh, main sources. And one thing that, I, that, that, that struck my attention was specifically related to the, the last source that I mentioned, uh, which is about uh, the way uh, EAL, which is English as an additional language, is seen um, by, by the UK government and the way uh, the tuition uh, of English as an additional language has been developed uh, across the decades. Because prior to the uh, 1980s, there wasn't any... AL course as such, uh, there was more a focus on uh, um, on the tuition of English as a mainstream as a mainstream subject, and then uh, from nineteen eighties there's been um, more an interest towards the in the, the tuition of English as an additional language and focusing on breaking the barriers among people uh, and trying to. Uh, to rediscuss the idea of difference and diversity in general and the way people perceive uh, the English language as a, as a vehicle communication. Um, and so uh, until now, there, there is not a fixed, there's not a fixed uh, curriculum uh, in terms of ESOL in terms of tuition of English as a, a, a as an additional language, or ESOL as English for speaking of other languages, because colleges and uh, learning places across the country uh, just focus on the um, uh, criteria that are set out by different awarding bodies, and. Obviously, depending on the awards and certificates that these awarding bodies are putting forward, then uh, learning places are adapting their curricula accordingly. 
And so they make changes in order for students, for learners to pass the exams and get a certificate. Uh, one tendency that is happening now is to focus on uh, uh, skills for life, which is uh, focusing more on uh, the use of English in daily uh, situations, hence deviating from the traditional knowledge of the grammar, uh, as we would think of back uh, in the previous decades when languages were taught. Uh, and so more of a, a pragma pragmatic, more of a uh, hands-on, let's say, approach, which is more uh, learner-focused, yeah, student-focused, rather than teacher-focused. And this is an approach that we see in ESO uh, more than in the tuition of other subjects, and you can give your opinions about this, uh, but what I can see in terms of uh, language tuition, when it comes to the English language, uh, teachers tend to focus on the learner's experience in order for them to absorb the language and to be part of the language. And so become active members of the learning process. And so adapt the curriculum to their needs uh, is paramount, even though there are no set rigid guidelines that could help uh, language teachers, for instance, because EAL is not considered as part of the national curriculum. Uh, because obviously, when we prepare students for uh, uh, formal education, uh, like GCSEs or, or acad academic studies, uh, then the uh, national framework focuses on the knowledge of, of the language from a native point of view, which is different. Obviously, there are different skills involved. There are, uh, the, 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 the skill set is different because obviously uh, the national framework doesn't take into account variables, uh, variables such as like where learners are from. Uh, as long as they can produce specific text that is suitable for uh, the level they're studying and the course they're attending. So uh, there are a lot of divergences. Uh, and so, so yeah, this uh, strongly impacts, impacts the uh, tuition of a Welsh language because the government, Welsh government, uh, obviously has put forward uh, since 2016, a program to increment the number of Welsh speakers. And so by promoting the study of English as an additional language uh, to speaker of other languages, at the same time, the Welsh government wants to, uh, to spread the knowledge of this uh, minor language. So use the resources for ESO also to teach, introduce some of the language and culture, of Welsh language and culture. So using, uh, you know, uh, the mainstream language to divulge a minor language, which is quite an interesting approach, uh, especially in classrooms where learners come from different parts of the world. And many learners don't have any awareness of the English language, a Welsh language. So, and that makes things even more challenging because how can you teach a language that is unknown by many people and tell them this is not English, even though we are in an English class. So these are the main, the main points that I want to raise uh, during this session. And uh, yeah, it will be good uh, to know uh what your ideas are if you, any of you had the chance to have a look at the resources that uh, were listed in the uh in the group email and see what your perspectives are so we can take it from there Vincent, I already have put my hand up. Mm. Um, I can also watch the chat for Claire. Um, but yeah, if people want to use the lower hand, um, raise hand, you're welcome to. 
Um, why don't we take Claire's first? Okay. Shall I read that or can, can you see that, Vincent, or shall I read it? Uh, let's see. Uh, right. Okay. So coming from a background of teaching functional skills English, GCSE alternative to teaching English, I definitely seen the experiences that Vincent is discussing. The GCSE slash functional skill level is about critical thinking, expressing ideas and reading for meaning. With these, all the focus is on understanding and being able to use the grammar accurately. This creates a challenge. Level two ESOL certificate is the same as a GCSE in English, grade four, uh, uh, grade four slash grade C of fun functional skills level two. However, the assessments are widely different. I agree with the challenge of teaching our student English and they and then they discovered that, oh, uh, where is it? Discovered that, oh, it's going all over the place. Sorry, discovered that in fact, they also need to learn Welsh to become employable. Yeah, I yeah, that's an extra thing, yes. So this was my question. I'm sorry, I did read it very, very quickly. I apologize, I haven't done my homework well, uh, but I did wonder, so in the context, context of the EAL, English as an additional language, as I understood, the government is trying to in incorporate in that also the tuition of, of Welsh. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Now, is that mandatory for all students or is that sort of an optional? So you can choose between English and Welsh or is it both? I just want to understand a little bit what that means. So I can speak for my experience, obviously. Uh, so... Basically, uh, when we teach English in a classroom, we need to introduce some of the Welsh language and culture to embed it in our lesson. So to introduce our lesson, uh, we may be asked to add, for, for instance, the word of the day or some specific cultural facts about Wales that is pertinent with the main topic that we uh, about to teach, basically, in order to give a, a, a broader overview. Uh, we don't teach Welsh grammar uh, itself, also because I'm not proficient. I'm, I've am i been asked, I mean, the college requires all staff members to have some Welsh knowledge. We have to develop some language skills, uh, and that is mandatory. And um, regularly, we are assessed. We have not assessed, like, formally in terms of language proficiency but we're asked where what level we've achieved so far so it's quite broad and generic but we need to obviously highlight the fact that we are in wales and we're teaching in a country where there is another language as well so we need to give some kind of awareness now reading what claire was saying um yeah, so we're staff teaching in Wales, also required to develop our Welsh language skills. This is in our contract, yes. It's part of our contract. So Wales, Welsh is mandatory, but obviously there's no like strict rules, and Claire can correct me if I'm saying something wrong, anything wrong. Uh, we need to have some knowledge of, of Welsh, and that is part of our extra hours that we need to achieve at the end of the academic year in terms of uh, uh, training and uh, further uh, personal development plan. So, so yeah, that is part of our professional uh, professional improvement. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, they aim for uh, higher proficient Welsh speakers, but the resources. And, it's, and time constraints don't allow uh, an in-depth um, knowledge of Welsh language and or culture, really. So it's a bit of a it's a bit of a challenge for us. And Claire can add more to that. Vincent, just to have clarity, in Wales is education for all other subjects in Welsh. Just to to clarify, or is it British English? Is British English is British. English, yeah, yeah. You can get you you can stu yeah you can study the modules in Welsh, but it mm -hmm. is not um, it's not mandatory, no. But Welsh is part of the curriculum, so people are required to have some knowledge of Welsh, but 
as things stand right now, there's no like uh the, there's no well she doesn't cover all subjects. It's not used for the tuition of all subjects. So uh is is another subject to learn, basically. But all, all modules are taught in, in English. Yeah, Willy. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Vincenzo, for all these perspectives, which I am evidently discovering. Uh, I've got some questions, which are more in the order, in the order of the curiosity. Uh, all the questions, since you said uh, you invited us to uh, to to grasp our, our perspectives, these issues interest me more, which is the relation to the nation state. Uh, is this sort of integration um, envisaged in the article in one of the sources you you recommended us? Is this integration searched through the teaching of Welsh a form of maintaining the nation state, sustaining the nation state, and at the same time contesting the United Kingdom one? Or is it in the other approach, uh, sustaining the UK, sustaining the legitimacy of the UK by presenting a perspective of um, integration, of inclus inclusiveness? Because the, the word integration, uh, for, from a Brazilian perspective, is, could be quite problematic, and notably concerning um, indigenous peoples the integration under this perspective means something very um very um colonial uh homogenizing um or almost genocidal so this is why uh this leads me to a second question uh, rigid you mentioned the the absence of rigid guidelines and and this is why i would like to know if they are necessary is necessary, is, is it invisible to, to have guidelines? Um, so some questions, I'm sorry if they are not clear enough. Uh, no, no, they, they're clear. It's just, I wonder if Claire wants to add something because obviously she comes from the, from the same, from the same environment, so. I just want to I, I don't want to take the old place myself with questions and answer I want to see if there there are some other contributions um yeah uh, okay I'm just reading through the messages okay so right so uh, I can answer for this question but obviously uh any of you just yeah uh, just give your opinions and if you know Whatever you know, it would be good to share it with the rest of the group. Um, I can't tell whether this, uh, the, the, this Welshness is meant to separate the country from the rest of the United Kingdom. I cannot make a, a strong statement out of it because I didn't set out the uh, documents that, are, that have been re released by the Welsh government. Uh, but one thing that, that comes out from uh, the uh, documents that have been released that are available from the, on the Welsh government website, which I can share even today later on in the group in the group email, um, is that uh, as foreign learners are in a reality that is different from the other realities in the UK. Uh, Welsh language is seen as an aspect, a vital aspect of Welsh identity, but also the knowledge of the language uh, is seen as a way to uh, enable further integration within the community in the sense, not in the sense of homogenizing people, but in the sense of welcoming diversity within a diverse reality per se. So because Wales, Wales is a bilingual country, officially a bilingual country, uh, and because obviously asylum seekers and refugees are 
uh, found uh, find themselves in a reality that is, that is different from theirs, if they want to integrate more, is is even better if they learn some Welsh because some communities mostly speak Welsh. So it's a way for people to feel more part of, of a community. Obviously, this remarks differences between Wales and the rest of the country. That's that's a fact because well, Welsh is the official language of Wales and not Scotland or England or Northern Ireland. So uh, obviously it gives a specific identity that stands out from the rest of the other countries. But uh, and what I find interesting is that in this document, uh, the, the official document available on the Welsh government website uh, is the use of ESL to spread the knowledge and the tuition of Welsh as part of, uh, of, of their plan. Because obviously as a bilingual country, people are expected to learn English as a first language because it's the most spoken language, but well, Welsh is important too. They want to give equal importance and and so i think it's integration within diversity uh, it's not about homogenizing diversity this is why i can read through the documents this is my understanding i can see some comments okay yeah is it, yeah it's, it's a very interesting contribution i uh, wonder if any of you have come across any similar realities maybe in other uh, places or uh, if you any of you can share some personal experiences in terms of language tuition in mainstream education as opposed to minor or endangered languages that could be interesting to see how this is developed in other in, in other environments Uh, Vincenzo, if I may, I I have had I I've, I've been thinking about this because you know obviously, so I'm based in Ethiopia. For those who um, my my work has been based in Ethiopia for for the past decade, and uh, we're now going through a war which has ethno religious uh dimensions, but um, in general, um, Ethiopia is a federalist sort of state right so we have multiple ethno-religious groups uh and then regions the 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 country is organized according to ethno-religious uh regions and and these are i, I would say uh, roughly homogenous but they're not and that that's where the tensions have you know arisen over the years um but that means that at regional level the students learn their own regional language uh ethiopia has multiple languages um so they, they learn the original language up to a certain grade point, and then they can move to learning, you know, it's Amharic, which is the kind of national language of the country, uh, where after that, all education is in Amharic. Um, and, and that has created problems in the sense that Amharic is oftentimes seen as a colonial language, which I think is inevitable in every context of the world when you have a single language being um, considered normative in a multilingual environment. Um, so so I, I think those pro I mean, Ethiopia has not eschewed those problems. That's what I'm trying to say. It's an open question also for Ethiopia of how you achieve that. Most students want to learn Amharic because as you said, employability depends on that. If you don't speak Amharic, it's a business language within Ethiopia, you just can't make it. And especially with urbanization growing, people want to move from the rural areas to urban areas where Amharic is being used, right? Um, and so they want to embrace their own language and regional heritage, but the incentives are such that people need to, you know, learn and, and, and uh, exist in a different language that is favored by the system, if that makes sense. Um, I don't know how, I mean, what works best, but I, I do wonder if that, what I just said, having students learn in their regional language, so mother tongue, <clears throat> excuse me, mother tongue, uh, or whatever the correct term might be, maybe first language is the right term, I'm not exactly sure, I think this is a debate, uh, but you know, the, the closest language in which they're socialized and in, in which they're born to, to learn that, 
um, in, in multilingual countries, if that makes sense. And then up, up after a certain grade point to start, you know, um, learning, you know, within a language that is normative is, you know, is, 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 is again, is important for employability. Now, I don't know what, as I said, I'm not versed in the Welsh environment to understand exactly the dynamics and which language gives one more opportunities, what the incentives look like. But I would think, as you said, Welsh is a minor language as opposed to British English, which is spoken across, you know, the different parts of the Great, Great Britain. So I would think that that's an incentive for people to learn English, if that makes sense, British English. Um, and, and maybe that then uh, means that Welsh is minoritized as a language and, you know, not, not appreciated even. So, so that maybe, that maybe ra raises questions around identity crisis, which we all have when we abandon our heritage or we're not allowed to embrace our heritage for, you know, which includes language. Anyway, some thoughts to put out there. I might not, you know, it might not be relevant, but I do wonder what people think about this and what you and Claire, how you'd, you'd respond to that. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh... Okay, just reading Claire's comments. Um, in Wales, Welsh is an essential part of Welsh education up until the age of 16. However, other Celtic languages, Scots, Cornish, Gaelic, etc., are not essential. Instead, many schools offer them an option in those geographical areas. In the main body of England, the second language offered in schools are generally French, Spanish or German. In Wales, Welsh is important to employability. None of the other languages are. Should all British students be given the opportunity to study Welsh? Mm, that's an interesting question to raise. No, it is. But um, considering the difficulties that, you know, what the Welsh government is facing within its own territory to to increase the number of speakers, I guess, given Welsh, turning Welsh as an optional language also beyond Wales, I guess it it it, it it's even more challenging and it's uh, even more difficult because. Yeah, it's got a different status compared to the other languages spoken in the UK, but at the same time, considering the, uh, the you know, this, the strength of the English language uh, in the workplace, in daily life, in, you know, in communication in general, I'm not, I don't know to what extent Welsh will be studied beyond the Welsh the Welsh borders, but obviously, uh, yeah, it can happen. But I don't know. Uh, I I I don't have the answer for this. But I don't think uh, I I I find it extremely hard to to be given like a, I don't know to 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 be considered as a as an another optional subject module in formal education beyond Welsh territory as things stand now also because of the uh, BBC article that I I proposed for this meeting for this reading session which speaks about the erosion of the Welsh language so Welsh language itself is uh, he is strongly affected by the English influence because there's loads of words that come from from English that have been either transcribed with uh, a Welsh uh, spelling, or just put, just just introduced in, in in its own original spelling, in its own English spelling, and this has raised also questions about who should take part in the uh, national Easter board, which is the national uh, the, the the national festival culture, which is. Uh, which is one of the main emblems of Welsh culture because it's a festival uh, open to Welsh speakers. Uh, and so all, uh, the, all participants will present uh, works written in Welsh rather than English. And there was a case of uh, a rapper, if I'm not wrong. Is it a rapper? 
yeah, Sage Todd's who basically didn't take part in the latest taste of odds because uh, his uh, his text would include English words in his own uh, in his own piece. And so, what is Welsh? If we if we think that the English language plays a, an important part in Welsh culture in Welsh society, to what extent can we isolate the Welsh language from the its English influences? That's another thing, another issue to to raise. Monica has her hand up. Monica. Yeah. Thank you. Um... Yeah, just uh, so I just must premise that I I am not familiar with like the the situation and so so thank you very much Vincenzo for uh, giving us this in depth detailed um, insight. Um, what you just said, Vincenzo, made me think um, like the thing about the keeping Welsh sort of confined from certain influences from in English words in that case made me think of um also the debate of some languages in in, in Italy the francophone languages and so right where um eh, they need a certain structure in order for them to be acknowledged as languages and thus be able to be taught Right, so it seems a little bit of a, um, a paradox in a in a way. Right, on the one side we we are used to, and we I guess that's the experience of many of us that languages are evolving. Languages can be distorted, can have influences, and and they just evolve. No, uh, but at the same time, and often they evolve because minorities are coming. Like minority languages also come in with a certain vocabulary. Think of all like. English in India, for example, and other places of the world. But then, yeah, in, in Italy and probably also other places with minority languages, we have this case where they need structure, very, very specific structure in order for them to not be completely um, forgotten. And this is the case with some languages in Germany, which are no nowadays no longer uh, spoken at all. Um, but yeah, so these were just some reflections on your last point. I actually wanted to bring in also the example from India, since we were spoken, um, since um, Willy mentioned the thing about nationalism, and and Romina brought in the example from Ethiopia, uh, where there is so in India there is a very, which is where I have been like based for a long time, and and my main work is um, in South India. So um, as a colonized ex-colonized country English has been very very common across uh, across the board but with the current prime minister Hindi has become again very much a symbol of being Indian and so so he's pushing that agenda very much and he is resorting more and more often to exclusively to Hindi also when it comes to international um, correspondences now, what does this mean within the country? So within the country itself, there is a complex dynamic for which the North has always been a little bit more, has been more powerful than the South. And there has been a cultural, um, when one thinks about Indian culture, very often what comes to mind are things that are apart from the North. So the South has been very um, adamant to create, maintain and create its own identity. And part of that was to speak English because within India, there are so many different languages that you sort of need a lingua franca, which um, even today in very much a very uh, population that is very decolonially aware, many of them still resort to English in order to <laughs> uh, not to link themselves with 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 Britain, with the ex-colonizers, but in order to separate themselves from the North, which is sort of imposing a little bit Hindi. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to add this other level of complexity to uh, the thing, uh, to our discussion. Um, otherwise, yeah, no, in, in, in India, the, yeah, in South India, there are so many... So many different local languages. Usually, uh, people start with 
learning the local language, but it's Canada, Telugu, Marathi, whatever. And then um, English and or Hindi are introduced. And this is in flux right now. This is really changing a lot because language there is a very hot uh, topic of contestation as well. So, yeah, this is what I wanted to add from the Indian perspective. Okay. And read another comment from Claire. So English is an amalgamation of so many different languages. Um, it is, uh, in my opinion, it's a language that is lazy and steals from our other languages when it hasn't got the correct word to express itself. The English language is a constantly changing piece to meet the needs of the speaker, especially when English is the second language of those speakers. I uh, love when I hear teenagers nattering to each other in Welsh with a spatter of English expletives and tackle language. So there's a mixture, a mixture of words uh, coming from different sources, different origins. So yeah, that's another interesting point to raise. I can see Willie has raised his hands as well. Yeah, uh, I would like to thank Claire for this very interesting question. And uh, should all British students be given this opportunity to study Welsh? Uh, and this, I am. I teach Portuguese in in this context in France, and also I taught Portuguese for migrants in Brazil. Um, and but I I don't think I could give a contribution at this sense. Uh, I would like to. I think would, it could be interesting, or I think of the perspective of perspective of Guarani in Paraguay, uh, when Claire poses this question. Should the British students be given the opportunity to study Welsh? Because uh, the experience of Paraguay uh, is very peculiar, very particular from my point of view, because an indigenous language uh, became an official one, uh, obtained the status of official language of the post-colonial state, which continues to, to speak Spanish. And why do I say, uh, do I consider it a very particular experience? Because in other countries that also uh, recognize uh, indigenous languages as official, uh, I'm thinking of the case of Bolivia, Peru, um, these indigenous languages are not necessarily speak spoken by everyone, which is the case in Paraguay. Uh, whites in Paraguay, if they are Paraguayans, speak Guarani. Uh, Italian descendants speak Guarani, German descendants speak Guarani, uh, and if they are rural, uh, it can happen that they only speak Guarani and not Spanish. But and this experience made me think of a power of resistance, of possibility of nationalizing a manorized and colonized language, but this brings a perverted aspect, which is that the this was also a, a phenomenon of dispossession. It means that Guaranese, Guarani people were, were dispossessed of their language in a certain way, or they, their language was instrumentalized by the state in a certain extent, because they were marginalized in the society. It means that the power took their language and nationalized it, but marginalized the authors of this language, which are reduced to poverty. Uh, and what I am understanding from, from, from what um, Monica brought, from what you mentioned on BBC's article on the erosion of Welsh, is the hegemony of English, is that this process is leading in India and in the UK to the reinforcement of hegemony of English. Is that the case? Well, English is a, is a dominant language, not just within the UK, but around the world, one of the most dominant languages. And so, so yeah, the dominance of a major language, especially in its own country, is uh, the influence is even stronger. Uh, uh, 
Romina, we, I can see you wrote a comment. If, would you like to add something to this? I mean, I, I think it's such a fascinating conversation. And uh, one of our um, first contributors, um, Abia Longo, goodness, I forgot uh, the first name. What was the name? Uh, gosh, our contributor. Um, anyway, uh, it was a it was a podcast essentially that looked at Kiswahili being sort of a an alternative to English in the African continent. So we we were having these conversations at some point, and um, the, the Elise. So it was Elise Bialongo. Do check that out. It, it's on on our um, acoustic decolonial subversions contributions if you go online. And so what Elise was saying was that, well, actually, yes, Swahili, because it's spoke, spoken in many countries um, and communities, could be an alternative. But the minute you propose it, it's considered a threat to other la regional languages because it's just another, uh, as, as kind of really suggesting, another language that is being appropriated by powerful you know, um, synergies or contingencies to, to become normative. And when you have something normative being dictated as normative, it becomes exclusionary by definition, if that makes sense. So mm -hmm. it's it's just the same cycle of colo coloniality continuing by via the means of a different language, right? But but it has similar implications. So I was, I was kind of contributing that. And, you know, when I think of English, I mean, I could not agree more with Claire. <laughs> you know, I, I felt this epistemic injustice as a Eastern European of having to learn English, you know, after. So I, we migrated to Greece when I was very little at the fall of the Soviet Union and I had to learn a Greek. Uh, but because I was very young, you know, it kind of was natural to me. I consider it a mother tongue. Um, I was picking up Romanian for my parents in the in the, in the household. Um, and then I had to learn English and French within school because those were kind of the dominant languages and it's part of our education. Um, and not only that, but in Greece, we have the what we call the parapedia, which is um, the paid sector, the, the language learning paid sector. So you actually learn paid, you pay to learn languages and get all these certificates, the Cambridge Assessment Certificate and everything, uh, you know, in parallel to your school education. Uh, which, you know, we have nothing to do with English and yet we have to pay this much money. You know, this I'm thinking of my migrant parents who had to invest a lot of money for me to learn English and French very early in my life um, in order to have those options and possibilities in the future, right? Because of the dominance of the Anglophone and, you know, knowledge and science and so on. Um, but but essentially what, I, what I'm trying to say is that um, at the same time, I engage with colleagues who are English speaking in the African region. I've been in Ghana, I've been in multiple countries in East Africa. Um, where English is being used. And for them, yes, they have that colonial history and they are very aware of it, but people have sort of made it their own. I don't want to use the term indigenized. I think it's not on me to decide what indigenization looks like. I think that's a complicated discussion. Uh, but, you know, a lot of people feel that, well, it is a language that allows them possibilities. And, you know, within colonial experience, I've heard colleagues who said, um, in Senegal as well with French colonization, the French language, right? Telling me, well, actually learning French empowers me because I have those possibilities. And, and you know, I can I can kind of use the colonial system to my, to, to kind of subvert it, if that makes sense, in, if, if that's uh, the way to put it. And so what, so what I'm trying to say is kind of going back to Monica's point of what, what constitutes English, because there's so many versions of English. And Monica, I think you should articulate that because you raised that argument in, in our editorial, I think last year. You know, or this year, sorry, with your South Asia uh, specialist, Monica, what constitutes normative English? I mean, there isn't a normative English. That's what I'm trying to say. And I think this conversation around grammar with ESO, right? So much emphasis is placed on grammar. I spend my life learning English grammar, you know, in, in a non-English country as a high school student. Uh, but but that does, didn't necessarily make me able to, as you said, communicate and have those skills to, to exist in an Anglophone country. Right, that you were you were referring to, um, Vincenza. So, anyways, I'm just it's a, it's a question for all of us. You know, how what is English? It, it, and going back to Claire's point as well, can we speak of of the English language in in that sense? Yes, Monica, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, now first I wanted to uh, just. Um, add one little example from my own personal experience, which uh, again shows the, the normativity of English, but who is deciding the normativity again is important. And like Romina, I also spent money on learning my English and the certificates and so on and so forth. 
Now, when I first went to the UK to study, I had to give the the pay for, you know, English and then do the, uh, what is it called? Like TOEFL, um, no, TOEFL is IELTS. The, IELTS, the IELTS, yeah. So I did that, okay, could study in English, uh, in, in England. Um, after that, at some point, I went to um, study at uh, Hyderabad Central University which is in, in Hyderabad in India, and it is in English. So I wrote a uh, a thesis in English, teaching was in English, and that's the official language at that university. After that, I went back to, to the UK to do my PhD, but they required me to do once again a, um, an IELTS test. So even though India speaks like the university is officially in English. My work was in English, the teaching is in English because this is the language in which they have been colonized. Still, it's not good enough. When you go back to the UK, you have to once again be assessed by the British authorities, so to say, whether that English is correct enough or not. So there is a keeping the, like this, this thing that we would like to see language as being more fluid. And while on the ground, it is extremely fluid. It is very amenable to, uh, being distorted and and appropriated, made to feel more one's own. There are still, I, to me, that that example was quite. Um, I don't know. It I was taken aback a lot because it just meant that there is one English that is meant to be the the language of education and of knowledge and thus of power, right? Um. So other than this uh, example. I wanted to, however, also raise another maybe slightly provocative point uh, for us to think about. And so living in India and in other different places, I noticed that people at the end of the day, they manage to communicate, right? Communication is much more than one language or much more also than an amalgamation of languages. It is about presence. It is about rituals. It is about living together. So while we theorize about these things and while also at the colonial subversions we notice the difficulty of people whose first language is not english to get published and we are trying really hard to 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 support them in all ways that we can and there are many interesting initiatives as well to do that this is still within a certain um i would say within a certain framework of 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 rigor of of peer review and all of this what I want to say is that on the everyday aspect, on the everyday level, I feel, and again, this is provocative, I don't know, and this is only my experience, but I feel that at the end of the day, language is one part of a much, much broader experience. And I wonder, we as many of us being academics or teachers or in the sector of producing knowledge, are we putting too much attention to this right language has been at uh, like has been in all disciplines of academia of the humanities at least for the past 20 30 years on the like whether you think of language metaphorically whether you think about it like in so many different ways it has been at the center of all disciplines in a way or, or in the other so my question is are we imposing the idea that language is so central to power and so central to identity a little bit how it has been with the category of gender or the category of the person right um i mean the idea that these are the main characteristic the main defining elements of our beingness is what I would like to question a little bit because here we are taking it for granted and I do not suggest that these are not fundamental issues, but I'm just wondering if there is more to it and if, if it should be relativized a little bit. And again, my own experience in the field comes back to my mind where I struggled a lot to learn Telugu and Hindi. So my conversations were a mix between English, Telugu and Hindi. But this sort of not knowing the language is sort of decentered my experience from language to the body. So it was a much more embodied experience 
which I feel had I mastered the local languages or like had communication been exclusively linguistic, I would have missed out on so many other channels of communication, which I embodied, which are in the architecture, which are in the rituals and so on and so forth. So yeah, this is a little bit of a provocative question, but yeah, uh, how much emphasis overall should we give to language spoke like the, the linguistic in the linguistic sense that's that's my monica i shared the links to uh, the special issue that victoria odeni and Gillian lazar led recently please do read that if you haven't seen it william claire and uh, vincenzo uh, I think it's a it's a lot it's a it's a very substantive effort to move the conversation forward, picking on some of these questions. And also, Monica and I had a chance to reflect on some of our lessons as publishers, um, how difficult it is to encourage that multilingual publishing. Because, as Monica said, for many of our authors, publishing in English is considered an international publication, so it has a bit more prestige within their own. African or Asian universities, and so they want to publish in English. Um, and it, for us, it has always been a navigation of, you know, making sure that their careers are promoted in that effort, and we do the best to to you know to facilitate that for them. But at the same time, to promote other languages apart from English. And um, so, anyways, would love I'd love to know what people think about this. Yeah. Um... Yeah, the, the, this idea of yeah, the, 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 these contributions, these questions that are being raised are fundamental. Um, the point is, well, the way I see it uh, throughout through my personal experience, uh, through what I'm experiencing now uh, in my current job, is that communication is more important than the language used. Because what matters most is understanding being understood. That is the most important thing. But unfortunately, uh, the way things are structured are different from the way we wish they would be. Because obviously at uh, the national scale, uh, if a government wants to identify themselves within a set of sort of standardized imagery images that portray that country in a way to have a consolidate uh, identity that comes across goes across the boundaries the the, the 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 borders then in that perspective then it's fundamental to have some standardized set of criteria to identify the language. Uh, and because Welsh, uh, Welshness is struggling to survive, then it needs to use the same, let's say the same tools that major languages are using in order to impose itself, because otherwise it won't survive. I think that using it, and that's the thing that happens in different settings. I'm thinking of my past uh, PhD research that I conducted in uh, Angolan literature, where the language of the colonizer were used to decolonize the literature and the language and create a national identity. And so these authors created, put forward their own version of Portuguese language in order to describe their own country, which was in Portugal. And so using the language of the invader to sustain a national identity, which differs from the dominant cultural identity, then it's per se an act of decolonization so I, it's quite hard to, you know, to take part in this conversation in the sense that I can't say I stand on one side or the other um, between standardization or non-standardization, but I think 
in realities like this, if we don't use some strong methods that are like, you know, trying to, uh, to create an identity and sustain it, if we don't do that, then we risk, not we, but I mean, some realities cease to exist, unfortunately. Even though my main concern in my daily practice is to be able and enable the others to communicate, understand and be understood. So I go on the other side of, you know, of the spectrum. So, and I appreciate those cases when people try to communicate shifting from one language to another because at the end of the day what matters is the message itself rather than the tool that is being used to deliver a message but again in formal contexts and um, again a national level that i see that that is not a strong it's, it's not a strong way to preserve an identity for as important as it can be you know so so yeah there's a big contrast between these two but again i want to stress the fact that you know turning back turning back to the idea of using the uh, dominance language to promote a different identity um there you go. There is this document that I'll share soon, which is called English of Speakers of Other Languages, Policy for Wales. This was published in 2019, which I recently found. Uh, and this is available on the Welsh uh, website, Welsh government website. The final point of, these, of this document, one of the final points says, let's see if I find it again. Uh, there you go. So work with ESL providers and the National Centre for Learning Welsh to strengthen the promotion of the Welsh language in ESL courses and improve access routes for ESL learners to develop their Welsh language skills and contribute to the government's ambition to achieve a million Welsh speakers by 2050. So using, you know, the uh, dominance language to sustain its own culture, its own identity, to me, that's a step forward already on its own. It's using the tools that the government has in order to promote itself, to promote its Welshness. And I think, I, I, fair play to that, you know? So, so yeah, I think the use, it depends on how we use the dominant language and how we reconsider it. That's my my opinion. Thank you, Vincenzo. I just realized that the time has passed. Uh, it's supposed to be one hour, but it's been so interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. would you like to wrap up and sort of conclude? Yeah. Yes, you're right. I apologize for over speaking. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> Maybe uh, discuss the action points. So do you, usually we write a report after each yes. reading. Uh, would you, yeah? Right. So uh, basically what happens next is I gather uh, all the contributions and, you know, the main points of this conversation. Um, and then I write a report, which I uh, will later circulate amongst us. So everybody can make amends and can add or uh, remove parts. Um, we all agree on the whole contents of this report. And then, yeah, and then for a, uh, possible future publication on the decolonial subversion website. If it's possible to have these uh, video like subtitled. Yeah, so um, to... I'm going to save the chat. I think it, it saves automatically on Zoom on cloud. Um, it's recording on cloud, right, Monica? So we should stop it then. And um...